In September 2017, Loudoun County responded to a severe crash involving a converted bus and a passenger vehicle. The crash resulted in five critically injured patients with heavy entrapment and limited patient access. The incident evolved into a complex scene with a large number of EMS and fire responders, including crews from four air medical helicopters. A lengthy extrication ensued with concern for ongoing blood loss in critically injured patients. All blood products from responding helicopters were utilized and crews anticipated potential need for additional blood. Utilizing on-scene physician medical direction, a request was made to local hospitals to send additional blood to the crash site. Blood was sent in coolers and was utilized in the resuscitation. The after-action review of this incident highlighted the need for a more streamlined and formalized process for requests of this nature in the Northern Virginia region. Dr. Morgan and I began sketching out a formal field blood program the very next day. The research clearly demonstrates the value of blood products in the treatment of hemorrhagic shock, but blood products are expensive, highly regulated, shelf life limited, and can be scarce. The best solution would be to create a virtual massive transfusion protocol cooler, which would allow blood products to stay in inventory for hospital use, but be made immediately available to the field for the entrapped trauma patient in hemorrhagic shock. Since the patients from this accident were transported to Innova Fairfax Trauma Center and the hospital had a well-developed massive transfusion program, seeking their support for the effort was the clear next step. Now once the ball started rolling, it only made sense to regionalize this using the EMS Council as a conduit to establish an agreement between all the fire and rescue departments in Northern Virginia and Innova Blood Donor Services. So we developed an agreement with Innova, which gives access to this program to any member of the EMS Council. Now what this program demonstrates is the importance of collaboration between all partners along the continuum of care. The patient's hospital visit truly begins, not with registration, but when EMS arrives on scene. Having blood available in the field for EMS workers to use in times of critical need is an incredible step for trauma patient care in Northern Virginia. Anova Blood Donor Services has been in operation since 1965 and supports all of the Anova Hospital blood transfusion needs along with 90% of other Metro DC area hospitals. It's a difficult task. One day we could have a fully stocked inventory and then a single car accident where the victims use 50 units each could deplete our supply. We need donors with all blood types to step up and commit to donating regularly every eight weeks for patients in need. Donating blood takes less than one hour and makes a world of difference. Visit us at anovablood.org to learn more. Patients that need blood do better when they receive blood. Historically, EMS has relied on only IV fluids. There's now evidence that excessive use of IV fluids in patients with hemorrhagic shock may be harmful due to worsening coagulopathy, acidosis, and the dilution of the oxygen-carrying capacity of blood. Military studies have demonstrated improved outcomes with the use of blood products for the severely wounded. Trauma centers routinely use massive transfusion protocols for critically injured hemorrhagic shock patients. The FACTOR program enables a massive transfusion capability at the emergency scene. Due to the time requirements for getting blood packaged and brought to the scene, we want the providers in the Northern Virginia region to recognize the potential need for blood on the scene early. The protocol is based on three key concepts, sick, stuck, and survivable. Sick, the patient must have clinical evidence of hemorrhagic shock, as well as IV or IO access to administer the blood. Stuck. The patient is strongly anticipated to be entrapped for greater than 30 minutes from activation, making it logistically feasible to get the blood to the scene, remembering that transport should not be delayed for factor arrival. Survivable. Patients that are never responsive to even painful stimuli at any point in front of providers are likely to have non-survivable brain injuries and therefore are not candidates for the program. Providers will contact their EMS Operational Medical Director for approval. The OMD will contact the blood bank and activate the protocol. The blood bank will then prepare the blood products for transport within 15 minutes. 
The bags will be at the ambulance bay doors for immediate pickup by the courier, which can be any emergency vehicle, fire, police, EMS supervisor, battalion chief. Many jurisdictions are planning dispatch algorithms to assure the pickup is as seamless as possible. The Alpha and Bravo bags will then be delivered directly to the field and brought to the patient's side. As you can see, there is a complex process on the back end when you request blood. It is imperative to recognize the need for blood on scene as early as possible. Now, let's learn how to use the equipment and how to give blood products in the field. There will be blood in boxes and one equipment bag containing what's needed to provide warm blood products to patients in the field. It would be ideal to have one EMS provider preparing the warming device while two others inspect the blood and prepare it for infusion. Understanding you may not always have a third person, preparing the warming device first is preferable. Remove the device from the carrier and prepare the base unit first by connecting the battery to the base unit. The label on the battery should be on the same side as the label on the base unit. Then lock the side latches. Often the battery will already be connected to the base unit when you open the bag. Next, take the disposal out of the packaging and connect the cable from the base unit to the disposable. The arrows on the cable should be on the same side as the labels on the disposable. Do not turn on the base unit until the tubing has been flushed. It's important to know which blood products are in each box. Red blood cells and plasma will arrive in one box and platelets will arrive in a separate box. They need to be kept separate because they are stored at different temperatures. Each bag of blood has an external temperature monitoring device. The temp dot is sensitive to touch. Make sure you do not place your hands on it. Each unit will arrive with its own paperwork. There must be a two-person check for each unit of blood product being administered. The two-person check consists of three steps. Step one, check the blood type. You should expect to receive red blood cells that are type O. Plasma will not be type O. It'll either be AB or A, which is just fine. While platelets do have a blood type, any platelet type can be administered to any patient. Step two, check the expiration date on the blood unit. Step three, record the unit number or W number on the field transfusion record. If the blood product has a sticker on the back, this can be used. But not every product will have a sticker. In this case, record the number by hand. Be thorough and be accurate. I know the scene may be chaotic, but it's important to get this right. There cannot be mistakes in these three steps. After this two-person check is complete, you are ready to hang the blood. Ensure all clamps are clamped first. Spike the first unit of red blood cells on one side of the blood tubing. Prime the blood tubing through the filter and connect the blood tubing to the warming device's disposable site marked in and prime the remainder of the tubing. Remove the lure cover from the outgoing line marked out and either connect it to the extension tubing and continue to prime or connect it directly to the patient's IV. The disposable fits nicely on the base unit warming device. Now you can turn on the base unit by pressing the on off button on the back of the unit. The LCD screen will indicate that it is initializing and will make a brief sound. Initialization will complete in five seconds and warm fluids will be provided within 11 seconds. You'll notice two temperatures. The temperature on the right is in parentheses is the incoming fluid temperature and the temperature on the left is the outgoing fluid temperature to the patient. From this point on, follow the LCD messages and your protocols. Now we are ready to give blood. Give two units of red blood cells, reassess, including vital signs, 
If the patient requires additional blood products, begin alternating between plasma and red blood cells until both are exhausted. Only flow one side at a time, leaving the other side to be primed and ready for infusion. If you exhaust all red blood cells in plasma, then the patient requires platelets. Platelets will be in the second box, and this box should only be opened if platelets will be administered. Please note, platelets cannot be put through any warming device. Therefore, platelets must infuse through a second blood tubing set primed with a small amount of normal saline. Platelets can run through the same IV, however they cannot run through the quinflow. Although blood flows to gravity, pressure bags can be added to deliver blood at a faster rate. Blood can also infuse through an IO needle. If you notice the infusion rate is slowing, consider that the blood products are clogging the filter. This happens occasionally and it can be fixed by exchanging the blood tubing. I know this is a complex process, but you are medical professionals and blood saves lives. Anytime we can bring critical care into the field, we can save lives and improve patient outcomes. Thank you for what you do. Patients receiving a transfusion can have an adverse reaction to the blood product. However, the likelihood of a blood transfusion reaction is very low. And of the 31,000 transfusions at Inova Fairfax last year, less than one half of 1% experienced adverse reactions, most of which were minor allergic and febrile reactions. So, while infusing blood products, monitor the patient closely for these signs and symptoms of a transfusion reaction. Respiratory changes, acute changes in blood pressure, fever above baseline, flushing, urticaria, edema, and anaphylaxis, shaking and chills, pain at the infusion site, chest, back, or abdomen. Diagnosing a transfusion reaction in the setting of massive transfusion for a hemorrhagic shock may be challenging. If a serious transfusion reaction is suspected, stop the infusion immediately and replace the entire IV tubing set. Do not discard the blood product or IV setup. Place all of these supplies in the resealable Ziploc type bag labeled suspected transfusion reaction and bring it with you to the hospital. Keep the site open with normal saline and observe for any further changes. Vital signs should be recorded every five minutes until stable and documented on the field transfusion record, as well as the EPCR along with the patient's symptoms. Refer to local protocol and treat allergic reactions as you would any mild, moderate, or severe reaction. Contact online medical direction if needed. The receiving RN and physician should be notified of the transfusion reaction. So we've explained the background of the FACTOR program, why we give blood, when we give blood, and we've explained how to give blood. But remember, this is healthcare, so it didn't happen unless it was documented. So before the transporting unit leaves the hospital, it is essential that all of the transfusion record gets to the blood bank in a timely manner. Thank you for taking the time to watch this, and remember, you're the ones who make a difference every single day.